Chuck Olenek. I'm a reenactor. And for 36 years, I used living history in the classroom to try to bring history to life, the living history, right, for my students and to jumpstart their interest in the subject. And to that end, I would dress in the garb for the time period and get the music playing in the background for you know, that was appropriate to uh, what was going on in that particular lesson and I would bring in stuff for the kids to handle and try to immerse them in a culture and a time period. Well, I'm not in a classroom anymore. What I'm doing now is I'm repurposing myself and I'm doing videos on basically to justify all the garb that I have at home doing videos on California's past because it's something that interested me but I couldn't work it into the classroom based on what I was teaching so to that end I've been going up and down the state and I have put together a bunch of videos on uh, the California mission system and I'm trying to track down all these different facets of history and landmarks before they go away and uh, you'll see that stuff if you go look at my channel by the way it's, it'd be nice if you subscribe all right sharing it too would be good um, well I ended up stumbling across something when I was researching Mission uh, San Miguel I found out that there were a number of um, famous outlaws that ended up showing up at the saloons that were a outside of the mission and be inside of the mission which I'll have to explain but um, that jump started my interest as far as there's a new area because apparently Jesse James hung out around there um, and his brother Frank the Dalton brothers at some point showed up. Uh, Tiburcio Vasquez was supposed to have gone through there. Uh, there were rumors that Joaquin Murrieta was there and I got fascinated. I wanted to see if their paths crossed and so I started looking around. Well, in the previous video, I talked about causes of the banditos because as I was researching, I was realizing, wow, a lot of these guys are of Spanish or Mexican descent. What's the deal? And why there were why the use of the word bandito? And then I found out the anglicized version, you know, bandito. I'm gonna stick with bandito in this series. What was the deal? And I read that they ended up being considered like Robin Hood or Zorro as far as fighting for the oppressed, and that got me really intrigued. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at one of the first murders that occurred in the state as far as you know, over the gold rush. And we're going to take a look at um, one of the mass murders, which was like really grisly, that occurred over at Mission San Miguel. So I hope you stick with me on my journey. On October 1st, 1848, it's eight months after the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill. A man named Peter Raymond, or Peter Remmer, depending upon which source you find, um, he shows up at the mill, he's drunk, he's obnoxious, and he awakens a bunch of sleeping miners. One of the miners John von Pfister tries to calm Raymond down and he's talking to him down very gently and then asks so we're friends right and offers his hand to be shaken what Raymond does is grabs a hand and with his other hand he pulls von Pfister's uh, knife from his belt and sticks it through his heart and the other miners jump Raymond and they're holding on to him and he's going to basically be held 
Well, they're get, they take him down to Sutter's Fort, which is a different place than Sutter's and Alcalde, which is kind of like a combination between a mayor and a judge, can show up from either Sacramento or Stockton to judge the case. In the meantime, Raymond escapes custody, probably because he got help from his uh, mining partner, Peter Quinn, who was also a Navy deserter. And despite a $500 reward being offered by uh, the military governor of California, they vanish. Raymond and Quinn headed south and they tried to take ship over at Santa Cruz and failed at that. So they just kept walking. They're escaping on foot. They go through the coast range. They travel through the San Joaquin Valley and they travel along the Camino Real until they finally arrive two months later at Mission Soledad. And there they meet three other guys who are desperados. Right? There's Joseph Lynch, uh, otherwise known as Joseph Fisher, and he was a, um, a German immigrant. And there was Sam Bernard, or Sam Barbary, um, who was another sailor who had deserted and then uh, there was a guy named Mike and it turned out that Lynch and Mike had run into a man earlier or actually it was a couple of men earlier who were minors um, and they ended up murdering them taking their gold and their uh, horses and they fall in with these two. So now the five men are going to travel on down the Camino Real until they arrive at Mission San Miguel Archangel. Now when these desperados arrived at Mission San Miguel, the mission hadn't been a mission for a number of years. On July 4th, 1846, Pio Pico, the last Gover Mexican governor of Alta California on the eve of the Mexican War sold Mission San Miguel to three investors um, Miguel Garcia the former sailor William Reed and the now ex-soldado Petronilo Rios and Reed would take over one wing of the mission complex. He took over the convento part where that would be living quarters for himself and his family and where he established a store and a tavern. Rios took over the house he had built which was supposed to be the uh, quarters for the major domo. Now that's his. And I don't know what Miguel Garcia got. They bought all of this for the magnificent sum of $600. This is the gold rush. So you have immigrants flooding in and everyone wants their piece of the uh, golden dream and you got people panning for gold, you got people digging for gold. Reed tried it for a while and he stank at it, but he was getting gold. And the way he was getting it was he was using his store and his uh, saloon. But he wouldn't accept any paper money. He thought that the Mexican paper money and the American paper money was worthless, so he only dealt in gold and he bragged about it. Well, unfortunately, one night in December in 1848, he bragged to the wrong people. Six men, six strangers, are in his saloon, and he's bragging about how much money he made off of a recent sale of sheep. There's actually six that arrive at the mission. So besides Raymond, and Quinn, and Lynch, and Bernard, and 
a guy named Mike. There's also an Indian named Juan who was picked up by the party at uh, Mission Soledad, and he's going to be their guide to take them down the Camino Real, which to me is kind of funny because it's like one road. But okay, that's who arrives at the mission. So these six strangers are in Reed's saloon at one end of what used to be the Mission Convento. And in the Convento, they're, you know, living there is Reed's family, his, his wife who is pregnant, and uh, their three-year-old son. There's also servants around, and you know, the, okay. So these are the people that are here when these six strangers show up, and Reed starts bragging about. First of all, that he doesn't accept anything except for gold. And, uh, you know, it talks about his wealth. And then he brags about having sold a flock of sheep and that he made thousands of dollars in this transaction because this is the gold rush. You got to feed the people in the mining camps and they're desperate and, hey, supply and demand. You know, I had a cattle that might have cost seven bucks before, it might be going for several hundred. And, He's bragging about his money. And Reed is absolutely delighted that these people speak English. And so he's bragging to them, you know, to these six strangers, about his money. And, oh, that's interesting. And the group decides they want to spend an extra night at the mission. And so what they're going to do is they agree, you know, they're going to chop some wood, you know, some firewood, and that would kind of work out as a uh, payment for being able to stay there. And the next day, they leave. After supper, the women and children retired uh, to their rooms, and Reed is sitting around in the main room, you know, with his guests, and Bernard walks behind Reed and he's making a pretext of uh, he's going to stoke the fire in the fireplace and what he ends up doing instead is he picks up an axe and he hits Reed with it Reed falls dead and Bernard cries come on I've struck the first blow you know there's no turning back and that's when the killing starts and all six men were involved. Uh, Eleven people are going to be dead at the end of this, including Reed's wife, who, by the way, is pregnant, and their three-year-old son, and a couple of other relatives and servants. And they've ended up killing Reed before they asked him where the gold was. They found a money chest and they grabbed the gold and silver there. They grabbed some valuables. They grabbed uh, Reed's pea coat from when he was a sailor, which he'd really treasured. And they take off. So now the person who has discovered the bodies over at Mission San Miguel goes running over and he tells Rios over at the adobe. And Rios, thinking quickly, immediately arms the Indians that are working for him on his rancho. Once Rios had been informed of what happened over at uh, the former Mission San Miguel, as far as Reed and his family being murdered, the man who informed Rios ended up going to Monterey to inform the military commander there of what had happened and hoped that you know, troops would be sent. After a while, the outlaws double back. They may have gone as far as San Marcos Creek, they may have made it to San Luis Obispo and doubled back, doesn't matter. They come back and now they're thinking, hey, there was that adobe across the road. Let's rob that place. Well, when they show up, they see 
a bunch of armed Indians and decide that's not a good idea. Let's get out of here. And so they keep riding and they travel past San Luis Obispo and they're just going to keep going. Arguments start to ensue. One of the things that's going on is, I guess, during the killing spree, um, there was an old Indian that worked here and he wasn't killed, he was wounded. And there had been an argument about uh, that Juan should kill the Indian. And he didn't. Figured it, that he's going to die anyway. Well, now there's an argument that's going on about, well, you know, maybe we should kill Juan. Because, after all, he was reluctant. He didn't do his part. They don't realize Juan's listening to this, so during the night, Juan takes off. And so now the party's reduced to five. And they continue on south. So here's where the killers messed up yet again. Instead of riding around Santa Barbara, they went through the middle of town and someone over at the mission spotted them and passed the word. And the killers went on to a camp about a mile south of Santa Barbara. Well, they've been noticed. And now, here it is the next day, a 15-man posse ends up pursuing them. And they're on fresh horses, uh, they are heavily armed, and it's pretty easy to catch them around Rancho Ortega. This is where it starts to get fuzzy. Uh, depends on which account you read. One account says that um, Peter Raymond was shot and killed right there, and that uh, Bernard jumped off a cliff, attempting to get into the ocean, and well, he did, he evidently drowned. And that left uh, Quinn, Lynch, and Remmer. Wasn't that the alias for Raymond? To be alive, taken into custody, put on trial. By the way, what happened to Mike? The three murderers and the body of the dead possumman were brought back to Santa Barbara and the murderers were put on trial and they ended up confessing to uh, the killing of John von Fister up north and also of uh, the two miners uh, that were uh, murdered by Lynch and company. And they signed their confessions and they were condemned to be hanged. While the three murderers were sentenced to death and um, you know, they were supposed to be uh, executed by hanging, California was still under military law. So what ended up happening is the commander of the Presidio in Monterey had to send a group of soldiers to go execute the three uh, murderers properly by firing squad. The three convicted murderers and the slain member of the posse were brought here in Mission Santa Barbara to be buried. Okay, we wrap that up. Nobody's in jail. The criminals have been punished. And now we're going to move on and take a look at Joaquin Murrieta, who is pretty much the benchmark for the California Bandidos. I hope you stick with me on my journey.